Hi everyone, welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Robert Grant, who is, among so many things, he's a best-selling author, an investor, an entrepreneur, a mathematician, and so much more, and I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Such a pleasure Um, to be here. It's so funny, you were saying, we connected through... um, Foster Gamble, who's been on the podcast before, and you were saying that he's connected you to other Persian um, mm-hmm. friends, and you must have like a history of I think I have a thing a with Persian life. friends. Yeah. It's really kind of funny. Um, I've got quite a few uh, so now fun. that I think about it, and even lots that I work with as well. I th- and so much, I, I think about this all the time because I actually, you speak so many languages, <laughs> and I, you know, I've always been told, because I speak Farsi, that um, speaking another language makes it so that you're really great at math. Mm-hmm. And have you found that to be true? Did you start with the languages and then found that you were really great at math or it was all You know, kind it's of funny when I, I learned my first language other than English, you know, that was my native language when I was 19 years old, I learned uh, Korean, Korean language. And the Korean language was particularly challenging because it's backwards in its syntax to English. So instead of saying, I am going to the store, right? And that exact structure, yeah. I am going to the store, it would be I to the store going am. Mm-hmm. So in order to translate into Korean, you have to wait for the entire sentence to be finished in English <laughs> yeah. because you don't know how you're going to finish the sentence because everything's kind of backwards. So um, simultaneous translation was one of my first jobs, actually. It was pretty funny. And, and I, I got really good at kind of thinking like that because it taught me how to multitask. Mm-hmm. And then after I got back from living in South Korea for two years, then I went to, I, I moved to Japan. So I lived in Tokyo for two years. I learned Japanese fluently. And I learned there was a system for learning languages. And the system was nothing like the Rosetta Stone. Mm-hmm. I created my own system. Wow. And I got fluent in, in Korean language in about three months. And so I figured out, you know, and this was at 19 years old, so I wasn't a small child who could, you know, yeah. have all of the, the special synapses that basically form for children that can learn language like no time flat. I learned Japanese also in about three or four months. And it had definitely helped living there. And I figured out that the way to learn it was to first learn the verbs mm-hmm. and learn how to conjugate those verbs. And rather than trying to figure out, you know, most people go and wrote memorized sentences yeah. or wrote memorized words that are nouns, I focused instead on verbs because I found the verbs generally didn't have root cognates that would be from the English language mm-hmm. etymologically or from Latin or Greek, which is really, you know, the Indo-European languages all kind of have this nexus point that, you know, kind of converges around Latin, Greek, and, and some of the Indo, uh, you know, Indo languages as well. But basically what I found was that by doing this method, you could figure out how to be fluent in a language if you could conjugate verbs and you knew 2,000 verbs. Wow. 2,000 okay. verbs and you can speak a language. And then if you didn't know the word or a noun that you wanted to throw in to explain something, you could just say it in English with their accent. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> because the way all the other countries learn language is exactly the opposite. They make everyone memorize all these nouns, but they have bad pronunciation sometimes. Yeah. And so you have to speak it like in a bad German accent or you speak it in a Japanese. So it's like, I would say something like, what's the word for computer? What's the word for computer? You know, in French, it's ordinateur, but in, in Japanese, it's computer. Right. <laughs> so I'd have to just say it like that. I'd throw it in. And if I could mix it in with the correctly conjugated verbs, they then people would be like, yeah, yeah. they yeah. totally understood it. <laughs> and then I'd get really fluent at the language. And so I started looking at mathematics and I'd heard that all the time too. You know, I grew up I was, as a musician and people said, oh, you learned languages fast because you're a math, you liked math and you're good in music. And I never really fully understood that until much later in life. And then I realized that math itself is a language. Mm-hmm. And that really helped me look at math entirely differently. So I looked at it and th- thought, okay, what are the first 2,000 verbs that I need to learn in math? Yeah. And I said, what, what would be a verb? You know, how could I even think about what a verb is? And I realized that it was just as we could take a noun like the word text, 
and we can, we can ascribe ing to the end of it. We can append it with ing. It becomes texting or to text. That's called a gerund, right? Mm -hmm. You might remember in grammar classes. Well, texting implies that the, the action is unfinished. In French, we would say, I am in the train of texting, right? So, je suis en train de quelque chose. I'm in the train of doing something. So, what does that mean? It means it's unfinished. Well, in mathematics, what would be some way to denote something that's not finished infinitely? And I realized that it was a mathematical constant. Mm -hmm. So in a rational mm -hmm. tale on the end of that, right? Mm -hmm. So then I started thinking, well, then what are all the verbs? If pi might then actually be circling a diameter, right? So I'm circling and that never finishes as well because yeah. it's got this infinite tail on it. Then how could I apply that to learning the language of math? So I looked at it entirely from a mathematical constant perspective, and then I realized that the way that constants are formed are through waves intersecting, just like you've got on this flower of life jug here, right? That really represents all mathematical constants. Mm -hmm. They merge, and these waves intersect with each other, and where they intersect, they happen at irrational zones that then create all the geometry in all of space-time, and that geometry is actually bounded and controlled by circles and squares that are formed by these verbs that we call pi and Euler. I love the way your mind works. And so you started as a musician, mm -hmm. you started learning these different languages, you um, ended up realizing, you know, you have this different way of looking at math and you b became a mathematician. Mm -hmm. And then at what point did you go on to, um, th then you went into like the pharmaceutical industry? No. I mean, I was already in the pharma industry and medical device industry. I spent 30 years. Mm -hmm. I spent 30 years in those fields. And um, I had, I've been lucky to have a very successful career and been able to lead several large companies and small companies and mid-sized companies as well. So the whole math awakening in me it was kind of like a lifetime pursuit. Yeah. It was more like a hobby. And I don't even call myself a mathematician because I don't feel like a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? I don't call myself a musician either, even though I love music. Um, and I had a music scholarship and everything. I, I tend to think of myself today as just the person who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because when I was younger, I remember always thinking I needed to fit in. And I thought that everybody saw the world from a logic perspective like I did, you know, and that's kind of like life. We have this persona that we create, all the things that we are ashamed of in ourselves, we want to hide and we sort of cut them off from ourselves and say, that's not us. Yeah. And then we don't even realize it. But then by doing that, we start judging other people that have those same things and saying, oh, I don't like that. You mm -hmm. know, that, that's terrible what that person does. And without even realizing that we're just judging ourselves mm -hmm. in the process, and so we build up this persona and we become more and more and more separate from the world. We create this thing that we think is this paragon of perfection and narcissism is not true love of self. It's really falling in love with this, this selection of projection that you've decided to project out. But by the way, you're the only person that can't see all the rest. Yeah. Because we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we decide we are. And as a result of that, I realized much, much later in life, that the thing that is most incredible about being here in this incredible world is the uniqueness with which we see the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we often in the spiritual community kind of get stuck into this thinking of, oh, I need to basically converge into oneness. I need to, and that's a great feeling. It is an amazing feeling. But this process of individuation is actually learning to fall in love with and be comfortable with your selected life path and the very, very unique way that you see and experience the world. And that is the most viable thing in the entire universe. The uniqueness that we each bring allows the universe to experience itself through our unique eyes. And that is building an Akashic record of data. Mm -hmm. And so we're serving a purpose for the universe to be able to experience every different kind of possible situation and emotion. And when you realize that, then you go, gosh, that's the whole reason I am what I've been looking for. Yeah, you're so unique. You see the world differently. And when you can understand that at a younger age, mm -hmm. I, I'm a mother of two and I have a four and a half year old. And, um, and just like you, when I was his age, 
especially I realized I just wanted to fit in. I didn't want people to see me as this Iranian girl that went to school with her garlic yogurt. Like I just garlic yogurt. Yeah, I would take it to school <laughs> against my mother's will. I don't think will. I've ever had that. I got to try that. <laughs> it's really good. It's called Must Musir. Um, must Musir. Yeah, so I, you know, I think that so many of us like you said go through life wanting to fit in and then yeah. um we forget that that is what's so beautiful about us is that we are unique and we have these unique experiences. So when does that individuation start to happen? I I've heard like Rudolf Steiner say, you know, um, even like not doing sports, I was told until the age of nine team sports, because you want to have that, um, root of like who you are as an individual before mm -hmm. you go into like what you said was eventually this idea of oneness and coming together, but really having that understanding of who we are as a person first. I think it's part of this whole life arc that we go into. Mm -hmm. um, I used to believe in coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I used to believe that things were sort of happenstance and, and I believed in randomness as a mathematical principle. And then when I started looking for patterns, I realized that every pattern I had a hunch there might be one for actually was a pattern, right? And that's when I discovered a prime number pattern in 2018, which then I'd always thought prime numbers are supposed to be something that there was no pattern to. That's why cryptography is sort of the foundational basis of it is built upon this notion of primeness. And when I realized that there was a prime pattern and that I could predict prime numbers infinitely, and then I published that paper at Cornell, I was like, wait a minute, what else changes now? And obviously there's big impacts on fields like cryptography and many, many other places in computer science. But what it did for me was tell me that my life is predestined. Mm -hmm. And that's what you believe. Yeah, I do. And I believe that the path is exactly as it should be. And yes, in my particular case, and I believe this is the case for many, many people, you go through this cycle of separation. You're born to your mother. Hopefully they have a mother as wonderful as you. Mm -hmm. And we immediately feel like I have a young daughter right now. She's uh, seven months old. Aww. And she's just now starting to go through separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. Right? So it was never a problem before I could take care of her all the time, but now she wants mommy, mm -hmm. right? There's like this thing, uh, there's this weird deal. She likes hanging out with me as long as mommy's not too far away. Yeah. And this has only been in the last week or so. And we all go through this notion of realizing that we're separate. I don't know what it is that flips the switch mm -hmm. for us, right? But it flips. And then through a series of feeling shame, we decide what we don't want to be. So it could be, and we call this trauma, but I don't even like to use the term trauma because I believe we chose it all. Mm -hmm. We're here to learn and experience and we're serving a higher experiential database as well, but we're also here because we chose everything on a menu. This is what we want to experience. This is the life we want to have. And that's hard for some people to hear because they're like, but why would someone choose to suffer? Well, that's, again, applying how we look at the world in this linear time construct. But let's say if I were a mountain climber, I wouldn't be happy climbing the hill behind my house. Mm -hmm. If I were a mountain climber, I'd want to take on Mount Everest. But doesn't that entail a lot of suffering? Well, yes, it does. And when you start looking at life from that vantage point, then you start realizing, wait a minute. I've been judging the whole world around me based on what I would like for myself. That's kind of like at Christmas, buying everyone gifts that you would want to receive. Yeah. Rather than what they would actually want to receive. Mm -hmm. The best gift givers are the ones who know because they've done so much research, they figure out exactly what you would want, not what they would want. And so we're living this life applying the way that we would want things to be and then calling that and, and judging negatively the world around us because it's not how we would want it to be. Mm -hmm. And we all fall into this trap. So I think when we go through this separation, and you could see this in like a Buddhist wheel of life type construct, whereas, and I drew this out, and there's one on my website called Mankind's Evolution that I wrote. As it hit me one day, I was like, okay, we go into separation, then we start forming an ego of separation, right? And then we start saying mine, 
You got a brother and sister. That's yeah. my toy. No, that's my toy. Mine, mine, mine. It's like mine. Mm-hmm. And there's this notion of possessiveness, right? And then from that, we start going into these other areas like, okay, excess and gluttony, right? And maybe it's overeating or indulging or whatever. And we go through all this and then we get to about 40 years old and we've separated out. But even before we get to that stage, I remember when I was 22, I thought back and I said to myself, just like Mark Twain did, when, when I was 15, my parents were like really dumb. <laughs> By the time I turned 22, I was amazed at how much they'd learned in seven years. <laughs> because for me, everything was very black and white. Yeah. At 15 years old, it was every answer to the universe I already had. I was like, mm-hmm. I got this down. This is easy. What are all these like crazy, stupid older people that can't figure this stuff out? Yeah. What is wrong with them? Why is politics all wrong? That should all be one way or the other. It's black or white, you know, capital punishment. This is what it should be. And as you get older, you start realizing that it's a lot less about black and white and more about grays. Mm-hmm. And so when I got to those stages of life, I started realizing that I had very little empathy. And why was it that I had very little empathy? Well, maybe it was because what I thought was the whole truth was just one facet of the truth. And that was my point of advantage. Mm -hmm. That I've been seeing the world from my own beneficial vantage point. Mm -hmm. And that was like a big wake-up call. So then you have this big, wait a minute, this is like a spiritual awakening. And often you're going to have, you know, this experience of betrayal. In my case, it was extreme betrayal because I realized later on that if you're here to learn whatever it is you want to learn, so let's say you have this menu of life and on your menu, you wanted to learn certain principles. And let's say your principle that you wanted to learn was unconditional love. Then you will have a lifetime of experience of learning its opposite and experiencing its opposite. Wow. Until you finally realize the learning that you'd always wanted to learn. So we learn what pleasure is by experiencing pain. We can't know what pleasure is unless we know the extent of pain. And the degree to which we know what pain can be will actually heighten the degree to what we know that pleasure could also be. Everything has to be in its contrast, in its opposite. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm here to learn unconditional love, then what is conditional love but betrayal? Betrayal is you don't feel betrayed by somebody who you didn't care about. You only feel betrayed by someone you did care about. So, okay, so you don't believe in anything being random? Nope, not anymore. So I only felt like what had happened was I was too close to the tree to see the forest. So when you zoom out Mm -hmm. and you could see the larger pattern, then the patterns start to reveal themselves. And those patterns also can be revealed in cycles of your life. The things that you keep experiencing over and over again, very likely is because you will continue to attract all the things that you judge until you no longer judge all the things that you attracted. And that also goes into this idea of like ancestral trauma or, you know, experiences through patterning in that sense. Maybe it wasn't necessarily something, but yeah, I guess if it's not random, you know, it's like I... I'm coming through to maybe do you think in stop do you think it's possible to stop the pattern like yes. by by experiencing finally well, by that. realizing the learning yeah. it starts to arrest the pattern mm-hmm. right the moment that you stop judging it negatively and you no longer get triggered by it negatively then you no longer have to experience that pattern therefore the experience no longer serves mm-hmm. because you've learned it this universe is an experiential learning, spiritual life s- simulation. Experiential learning, spiritual life simulation game. Yeah. You could think of it like that and we could call it Maya, right? The illusion. Yeah. But we cannot learn through didactic alone. It has to be, and we're not going to be sitting in some classroom. The best way to learn is to say, I have a memory of how I felt of this emotional state that I had when I was betrayed or when I fell in love. You know, one of the things I just realized, I was um, with uh, a a mathematician and a psychologist at UCI uh, by the name of Donald Hoffman. And his partner in like publications is 
uh, Professor uh, Chetan Salhotra. And both of them are well published in all kinds of journals for, you know, like big publications, Scientific American. They're the world's experts in mapping human consciousness mathematically. Wow. So they both came to visit me in my office and they said, we've got a question for you because they'd read my book and everything. And my, my book, uh, Philomath, has a lot of new mathematical discovery in it. And so they said, look, we'd like to see, you know, what are your thoughts on being able to apply a mathematical equation to emotional states? I'm like, well, we're starting with easy questions, aren't we? It's like, <laughs> how do you apply a math equation to an emotional state? And I was uh, on an airplane a few weeks later, and I was flying to Salzburg, one of the music capitals of the world. And it struck me right then wow. that music can induce emotional states. Yes. And math and music are actually the same thing. They're just two different expressions of the same thing. So then I started thinking, well, you know, the, the part of the brain, the left temporal lobe and the right temporal lobe are the seats of math and music. Mm -hmm. So the right temporal lobe, if you're right-handed, is going to be music and the left temporal lobe is going to be mathematics. And the center point between those two points is geometry. So you could say that geometry is the music that we experience with our eyes. And mathematics is also a form of music. It's like the code mm -hmm. that is underlying the music that we're experiencing. And so I, I looked at this and I thought to myself, well, what is it that causes emotional states in music? And I realized that it was coming down to mathematical ratio and relative to intervals mm -hmm. in music. So in music, we have these tones where we go, da, da, that would be a major third, da, da. We play that on a piano, it would be like C to E mm -hmm. on a piano, middle C. And, and everyone reports through scientific studies as well that they listen to the chord, da, da, together, and they feel joy I was going to ask you, so it's the same happiness. across yes. population. Okay. That's right. It is. It's the same across population. And it's independent of whether it's pentatonic scale or whatever. Wow. It's the same across population. And, and so I started looking at all of the different notes. And the next one would be da, da, da. And that da, da is called a perfect fifth, right? So C to G now. And, and so then I started realizing, wow, that's really cool. But then if you look at the inversions of those, so that would be ascending. So the, the major third is an ascending arc, but then there's also a descending form of that. And the way it works is that whatever you have, if you have a third, then its opposite or inversion has to be six because the two have to add to nine. Mm -hmm. So if you have a major second, then the opposite of it's going to be seven. Mm -hmm. Right. So that means that its opposite is going to be major has to then become minor. Mm -hmm. So it's like positive charge to a negative charge. Yeah. So it goes major second becomes minor seventh. Right. Mm -hmm. Major third becomes minor sixth. Minor third becomes major sixth. Wow. Right? See how this is all tied together yeah. and coming back to the completion number of nine. Kind of cool. But wait a minute. If you listen to a minor sixth the reported emotional state that people say they have, guess what it is? Heartbreak. Oh. So a major third, just simply da da, just like that. Now I'm gonna go to, that's a middle C to, a, to an E. Now I'm gonna go from a C, that's a high C, down to that middle E. Same notes, C and E, just played oppositely. And it goes opposite. from love Romantic love to heartbreak. Wow. So the only difference is time. Yeah. It's the ordering and the sequence that it's played in. Mm -hmm. So this means then that we, we listen to a major third, we feel love. We listen to a minor sixth, we feel heartbreak and sadness. Is it just a time function? So in other words, when we experience love, there's a seed of heartbreak. Wow. Just looking at it from the opposite yeah. time perspective. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or we experience whatever experience that we have musically because everything can be put into the spectrum of sound or music. Literally everything is in this light or sound signature. 
And that's when I realized time has this ability to flip polarity. And maybe this explains why when I look back on the most difficult, most challenging, most suffering periods of my life, I look back on them with love, joy, and gratitude Mm -hmm. because time flipped its polarity. How often have you said something that at the time might have been the worst thing that's ever happened to you? You look back on it and say, you know what? In retrospect, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. One of the main ingredients in our product line, Saffron, has been proven over and over again in clinical double-blind placebo trials to be an effective form of treatment for depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years for these purposes, and now the research is here to finally back it up, proving that plant medicines and ancient healing practices can actually be an effective alternative to pharmaceuticals. From caffeine-free latte powders to saffron baths and capsules, there's something for any modern woman looking for ancient healing. Again, that's code THEFULLESTPODCAST at checkout for 15% off. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. I mean, I literally had that moment right before I came to meet you today. Like, it's just crazy. I, um, like... My kids have a genetic condition, Mm -hmm. but you can't tell what it is. It's a rare genetic condition. And I was fortunate enough to connect with Dr. Zach Bush, who's their their endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just going crazy, like counting how many they have to eat every certain number of hours in in order to stay alive. Like the whole medical community stressed me out the moment. My children were born and I just, what, both of them happen to have it. It's so rare for even one to have it. And um, this morning I was getting ready to come here and I have typically with childcare, I'm like, they need to eat this and they need to do this. And I just had this moment where I was like, wow, this feels so good to not even have to think about counting or do anything because I know that they're okay. I know that they're safe because of Zach really helping me saying you just need to let go I'm actually here to be your doctor so that you know your kids are okay (laughs) because you no longer have to he's such a great guy yeah you no longer have to live (laughs) in that pain and that trauma Mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that I went through that and that I have that awareness and I think it made me such a better mom too so much more connected and but yeah I just had that like opposite feeling of just gratitude for having gone through that and like being on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so beautiful once you, um, yeah, have worked through it. Cause it also, you know, I think it requires a lot of awareness and work having, um, so that you're not like re-traumatized every single time. So I had a synchronicity coming here this morning. Yes. Because your address is a very special number. Mm -hmm. And, it actually is represented by the second pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Wow. Because the structure, the address here is 345. So 345 is a reference to a Pythagorean triangle that is the most divine of all proportions. Wow. Did you know that? No, I'm really into numerology, but I didn't know about this. So I add so you, everything you up. You chose a good place to be at because it's like resonating at a divine frequency because there's no coincidences. Yeah. Right? So three, four, five is the relationship of a three, so a triangle with a base of three, mm-hmm. four would be its height and five, its hypotenuse. Wow. Okay? So that's exactly the proportions of Caffrey pyramid, the second pyramid on the Giza plateau, the one that's in the middle mm-hmm. that most people think is the great pyramid because it looks bigger because it's on a, about a 33 foot elevation compared to elevated ground, uh, you know, compared to the great pyramid, even though the great pyramid's taller, it's only taller by about 10 feet. Wow. But, but the three, four, five is unique. And here's what makes it so unique. What makes it unique is I just told you that there's majors and minor chords in music. So positive experiences in time with time can flip the opposite direction, mm-hmm. right? They can, they can change their polarity. You could go from what you think was like, wow, it was so great to be in love. And then after a while you <laughs> break up and you're like, that was horrible. My yeah. heart's broken. <laughs> and then after a while again, you're like, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. Right. We all go through these different cycles. Well, the one pyramid on the Giza plateau of the three that has no negative state 
is the three, four, five. Wow. Why there's no negative state? Because it is what's called a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. So the inverse of each other doesn't flip polarity. Yeah. So it stays divine. So the perfect fourth is four over three, right? So that would be 1.333. And so when you're making a musical scale, you basically take the perfect fourth, you take a note, and then you can derive its perfect fourth by multiplying it by 1.333, one and a third. Mm -hmm. Then its opposite is the perfect fifth, which is wow. three over two. It's a simple ratio, three over two. So there's no negative state for the three, four, five. That's beautiful. I'm so, we just moved in here too. So it's divine. So this is like a blessed place. Yeah. And you didn't even know, but now you know. Mm -hmm. So you might not notice that when you come in, but numbers and geometry and everything matter mm -hmm. because when you see geometry, it's actually a QR code for your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. You could look at geometry, not think anything of it, but it's like your subconscious just absorbed all of it and then you're on an upgrade path you didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of geometry. That's so beautiful. Right, so that's what you're experiencing here. So when you look at and realize that the emotional states of mankind can all be derived from musical interval, right? And when you cross two octaves, there's 24 different types of emotional states. So that's kind of weird. When you think about it, is it really that simple? It's kind of like Zodiac, you know, it's like how could everything fall so perfectly mm -hmm. within, you know, these 12 months of the year, right? And, and you kind of go, wait, are they all just musical notes in a chromatic scale? And the 13th note would just be the beginning of the next octave? Yes, the answer is yes. So when you start thinking of those terms, then you realize that the smallest pyramid on the Giza Plateau is actually Menkari Pyramid. It's a five over four relationship, which is the major third. So it's both love and heartbreak. Mm -hmm. The Khafre Pyramid, the middle pyramid, is the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. It's stability, divinity. It's like perfection. Wow. And the Great Pyramid is the diminished fifth and the augmented fourth which is the imperfect man. Wow. Realizing that he's unfinished, realizing that he's not perfect, but in his imperfection is actually his perfection. Mm -hmm. So this arc of life, as we separate from our mothers and we go through life and we have this midlife crisis, and then we come back and then we start thinking, no, it's not about me. I wanna get rid of this ego. I'm going to like, like kill my, have an ego death and I'm going to come back to life and I'm just going to be all about, I'm going to change my name to one divine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I actually know lots of people that have done this, right? And then you realize after a while that that's not what where I need about. to go. Yeah. I need to go back to being Me. Robert mm -hmm. because that is my purpose and I'm serving. Yes, I realize that it's X and one over X the world around me yeah. is my you inverse around me. Yes, it's all me, but my purpose for being here, my raison d'etre is actually to fall in love with who I am and feed that data set to the universe. I love so that. that's coming full circle back to itself. That is individuation. I always wondered what the heck did Carl Jung think? Why was he thinking when he wrote the book Aeon Individuation? Why was he thinking individuation for enlightenment? Wouldn't it just be singularity? <laughs> and the answer is no. When you realize that it's you and that's who you've been looking for and the universe around you is just the one over X of you, then you can learn to self-multiply. You realize that every person you meet is a divine message from the other side. The synchronicities are all around you. Carl Jung also said, you'll know how far along you are in your stages of individuation based on the number of synchronicities you can realize and register. Wow. And do you think that people can go like in and out of that too? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we all do. Mm -hmm. We all go through different stages because, you know, life, just like in working out, you have to tear the muscle to make it stronger. Yeah. And our spirits are no different. This is just a basic principle. For every action, there must be an equal opposite reaction. There are seven hermetic principles that are inviolable. You, you can't break them, 
right? There will always be polarity. The world is not going to rid itself of polarity. Polarity will always be here. But how you perceive it and whether or not you're able to transcend it and stay in your I amness, right? Mm -hmm. I am is not only that I am the whole universe. It is realizing I am in my conscious mind and this world around me are just reflections of my subconscious mind. But when I can multiply them together, then I'm one. Oh. And when I multiply them together, I can tap into the super conscious mind. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So what do you think about, you know, I, I was mentioning to you, um, we really, really like to learn and research about this idea of these ancient rituals that mm -hmm. people, you know, across cultures have been used um, for inside out wellness, beauty and connection and going back to our intuition as women um, as well. And I find these ancient rituals to connect me back to my intuition. So we've shared so much about that. I find even like using a pendulum to be something as simple as reconnecting me mm -hmm. to myself. So what do you think about, um, what do you think about pendulums? What do you think about intuition? Like and magic? Yeah. <laughs> Um, witches and all that stuff. <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> I mean, well, is there like a mathematical <laughs> reason why pendulums could work or like, do you use one? I have one. Yes. Um, yes. There's a mathematical reason because everything is mathematics. Mm -hmm. You know, what we call magic or spirituality and, and really magic is just a, a, a higher realized state of spirituality yeah. It's, it's when you activate the higher chakras. So there are three layers within the throat chakra. There's a self-aware layer, then there's a, a self-actualized layer, and then there's a self-transcend layer. The self-transcend layer means that you're no longer perceiving duality in the way that you did before. You realize that when bad things happen to you, they're happening for your greatest good and benefit. Mm -hmm. And that you chose it all. The universe isn't happening to me, it's happening for me ultimately for my benefit, and I surrender to the will that is divine. Okay. So as we get to that layer, our voice actually changes. It's inaudible to most people, but people start listening to you differently. And we're in the middle of that process right now. We just came in, we had the uh, eclipse last night, mm -hmm. and today is the first day of Taurus, and I'm a Taurus. Oh. And Taurus rules the throat chakra. Mm, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. This is why the Great Pyramid is also called Bull Mountain mm. for the Apis Bull that represents Osiris. Osiris' other name was the Great Bull of the West. So basically, the Giza Plateau is well known to be the world's throat chakra. Wow. It's like a giant speaker, which then stands to reason that all of the pyramids are actually like a musical instrument. They're giving us all musical interval Mm -hmm. All 24 musical intervals can be represented inside the Giza Plateau. Wow. Perfectly. So it represents our emotional experiences, both sides of it through time and backwards time, this Ouroboros. And maybe the reason why so many of us feel connecting back to ancient origins is critically important right now is because there is no separation between the distant past and the distant future. So what we think of as being linear time mm -hmm. might not actually be correct at all. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, some people think that the earth is flat. Okay. I don't happen to be one, but I have <laughs> friends that do, and I, yeah. I respect that they really truly believe that. It's like, okay, I get it. And I'm not going to sit there and argue with you. I'm not going to be Neil deGrasse Tyson and be like, ah, I'm like, going to lose it on you. Because I believe we are in a holograph. And you could probably make a, you could probably convince me that maybe we're like laying in some vat of jello somewhere, <laughs> right? With some, you know, awesome VR headset on. Yeah. Right? Like Wally World. Yeah. <laughs> and all of this is just a dream that might actually only be taking two or three minutes of our mm -hmm. time, but we're having an entire lifetime. Yeah. Giving us this perception of an infinite lifetime where we could choose different careers, different partnerships, different experiences different talents. So it's really about changing our perspectives. You know, it's, I believe this fundamentally that if you want to change the world around you, change the way you perceive the world around you. Mm -hmm. 
nothing can change the world faster than changing your perception and what you're allowing to come in. We can often become the hammer that's looking for nails and whatever it is that we judge negatively. It could be, you know, whatever travesty that's being, you know, perpetrated on society right now. I could get so focused on trying to fix that. But maybe if the world really is a you inverse around me, if that becomes my sole focus, maybe all that will happen is I'll continue to see that reflection everywhere. Yeah. Because I've simply become the hammer that's seeking the nail of my confirmation bias until I finally realized that I was supposed to learn the opposite thing. And maybe that was acceptance and love. I don't believe, a lot of people ask me all the time, they're like, well, what do you think? How do we escape Earth? <laughs> it's like escape Earth. It's like that's the name of the game. I love right? that a lot of people ask you that. <laughs> escape Earth. Like, yeah. bro, like how do we get out yeah. of this place? Let's go. It's <laughs> like, let's get out of here. <laughs> right? Let's go with Elon. Go to Mars or something. And it was probably about 10 years ago that I realized that the more I wanted to escape it, the more dystopian it became. Yeah. And then I realized that the only way to transcend this plane of existence, this experience, is to fall in love with it just as it is. It's so true. I mean, I think we get caught up, especially, you know, in the wellness world. It's like, there's geoengineering, there's spraying, there's <laughs> glyphosate everywhere. I mean, this is literally me yesterday. I like, I can't get clean water. I literally go out and if I put my feet in the grass to go ground, like it's all filled with Roundup, like da 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 mm -hmm. And you can't get away from it, but you also just need to remember that at the end of the day, it's all about just our, yeah, our relationship with it and our like you said, our perspective of all of it. I mean, it doesn't make it go away, but I think that it makes us, it, uh, w relating to it differently does end up changing our life. Yes, and it's not that I'm saying that those things are not bad things. Polarity yeah. exists, okay? They are. Like, I don't use fluoridated yeah. toothpaste. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are things, everyone has their different levels, you know? It's yeah. like, if I talk to Shervin, he was like, it's, dude, what are you drinking? What are you drinking? It's Literally. like, I should have some sort of scanner on this water to make sure, sure it's like, it yeah. doesn't have anything yeah. in it, right? It's like, what are you doing to me? You're poisoning me. Because otherwise, we could live our whole lives like that and be very, very paranoid. Mm -hmm. And that's not living. And then what happens is you trigger all these like stress response hormones and everything. You've got like bad ghrelin. You've got all kinds of stuff, you know, cortisol that's like causing you to be overweight or whatever. And it's like, you're, you're making just, yourself sick. Literally. Yes. You're you know causing what? people that are happy and positive. Generally, they live much longer and the time they do live, they're happier. It turns yeah. out. Yeah. It's really true. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to Israel and, um, I had a chance to meet with some of the leaders there and, and I, 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 I'm not, Republican, Democrat, I, I will meet with anybody because mm -hmm. I believe I could meet somebody on the street or an Uber driver or a janitor or whatever, and I will learn something from him mm -hmm. or her mm -hmm. because they could be a divine manifestation from my subconscious giving me a message because that's how the subconscious communicates to us. It's through synchronicities. Mm -hmm. I'll be thinking about something that morning. I'll have no idea. Then I'll meet someone on the street who'll make one flippant sort of comment that's like, Oh my gosh, how did he know that? Yeah. What the heck, right? When you realize that everything can be divine, then everything becomes divine. Mm -hmm. It's not believing is seeing. It's, see, it's not seeing is believing. It's believing is seeing. Once you believe that that's the life you're living, then all of a sudden your life becomes full of miracles. And, you know, some people believe there are no miracles. Well, they'll not experience miracles then. Yeah. And the people that do experience miracles are the ones that believe that miracles exist. And then some people even take it to another level, which is life itself is the miracle. Mm -hmm. The people that I know that are positive and optimists, just like Sean Perez said to me, he said, never be a pessimist. Because I asked him, I said, as you look back on your life, what's the one thing that you were like most proud of? And he said, the thing that I'm most proud of is that I never look back. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, you know, we, we drive in a car. We have a windshield that's this big. We have a rear view mirror that's only this big. Yeah. We should use them in that proportion. Mm -hmm. Right. It's kind of like 
God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? Let's mm-hmm. use it in that proportion. And I, I think there's something to this. The people that I know that are optimists, they get ridiculed very often by the pessimists. They get ridiculed by the cynics as being Pollyanna and just, you know, you can't solve anything like that. But yet in their life, in their field, in their everything, everything just works out. Mm-hmm. And then the people that are always overthinking it have tragedy after tragedy after tragedy come upon them yeah. all the time. Statues will never be erected for pessimists. And the funny thing with pessimists is that they'll never call themselves pessimists. They call themselves realists. Mm-hmm. Because it's not socially acceptable to be a <laughs> pessimist. Right? It's kind of like round up in the grass. Mm-hmm. So we all have a chance to look and interact with the world around us. We can pick the pepper out of the salad and lose point of why we are here, which is to fall in love with the moment. So you can transcend above all of it. And if you are carrying a high enough frequency, all of those things will have no effect on you. I know. I, I, I really need to focus on that more. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was in Mexico in 2019 with Nassim Haramain, mm-hmm. a physicist who's also Persian. Yeah. And we were hosting a group um, of about 90 people across the Mexican pyramids and the ancient sites and everything. And, and I had done all kinds of research on the, on the Giza Plateau in Egypt versus the Teotihuacan Plateau, which is really Tehutihuacan, which is one of the names of Thoth, right? Which mm. is the hermetic wisdom, Hermes, Trace Majestus. Well, basically, uh, I told Nassim at lunch, I said, I saw us in ceremony today. I don't, I don't know when we're going to do this or what, but I saw you and I and Andrea and Victoria like at the four cardinal points doing a ceremony. And I don't know what it's for, but I, and I told him at lunch. So I said, so maybe we'll wait when everyone goes down the pyramid of the moon, which is the last, it's sort of like this, you know, structure dedicated to the divine feminine. I said, maybe we'll just have like a quick prayer or something up there if that's okay. And he said, yeah, sure. And the whole day went on, you know, the rest of the afternoon. And I was up there doing like a podcast and it took a little longer. And so people already went down and I was like, everyone left. So we didn't get to do it. So then I thought, oh, okay, maybe it was nothing. Who knows? So we walked down, I walked down the side of the pyramid. And then as I was walking towards the buses, um, the chief of the Toltec tribe comes over to me. and He says, Robert, uh, we're going to come here. Don't go to the buses yet. We're going to go to the, we have a special ceremony we're going to do at the um, heart of the feathered serpent, which is right across from the pyramid of the sun Mm -hmm. on the walk of the dead. And I still had no idea. I was like, okay, so we just walk over there and there's an altar there. It was about four feet high. And he says, Robert, uh, Nassim, Andrea, Victoria, stand up on the altar. Oh my gosh. And everyone gathered around it and they had their tribe. And he said, We're, we decided to, to induct or make Robert and Nassim shaman of our tribe, which are the guardians of the Teotihuacan Plateau. Wow. And they had this full ceremony and it was exactly as I had seen. Oh my goodness. And so he gave us both gifts. It was a two hour ceremony as the sun was setting. And there was someone, one of the photographers got this great shot of this beam of sunlight coming down. It was really beautiful. And he gave Nassim a mask. This was on 11-11-2019. So this was a clay mask that he had been wearing for 40 years. And it had a thunderbird painted on it. So it was a green mask with a green blue mask with a thunderbird, blue thunderbird, with a large eagle painted on it, like with its wings outstretched. And he said he's been carrying this mask for 40 years and he wanted to gift it to Nassim. And then he gifted me a heart. So he gave me a conch shell that was a flute. Oh my gosh. And it was about the size of my hand, the size of my fist. And, uh, and it was painted with a phoenix, and it was red, right? So it was the opposite, like, complement mm-hmm. to this. And I have great photos of it. And, and he told me, he said, you have access to the cosmic knowledge. You have to share it around the world, and you have to play this flute at all the ancient sites on the Nazca and the ley lines. That's so beautiful. Is that when you went on to host Code X? Uh-huh. That's so crazy. Mm-hmm. 
So then I took that flute and I've gone to several places in the world. I've played it inside the Great Pyramid. I've done all the things that I knew I was supposed to do, right, as part of playing my part in this global activation, I guess. And it yeah. was done with intention and ceremony. But I remember thinking, okay, what's the purpose of the mask? <laughs> this was one week before the first outbreak of COVID happened in Wuhan. That's so crazy. Within two months, everyone was wearing masks. And think about what the mask, the word mask is in Latin. It's persona. Mm -hmm. So we all went through this experience that it was sort of like the last experience before realizing that we were just living personas. Mm -hmm. I think that's what COVID did more than anything else. It basically brought on a global spiritual awakening to people realizing that we're living these personas that are kind of fake. Yeah, your whole life, like in a day, transformed basically in a month. And you had to really sit with yourself inside your house. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one, I mean, no one wanted to do that. Everyone wants to be go, 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 go. And then everyone was forced to be there with themselves and be in relationships that may not have worked out. So then they had to figure out, I mean, it was a true reevaluation of our lives all on a mass scale. So crazy. It reminded me of uh, dragonflies because dragonflies start off as these little, you know, bug looking things that are underwater. Right? They're like this little larvae. And then they finally, at some stage, climb up to the top of a reed and they go through this period of molting and everything. It's kind of like a butterfly. But they have no idea when they're born that they have the ability and that one day they're going to fly outside of that riverbed. Mm -hmm. They literally have no clue. And so then they go and they think they're dying. They're suffering. They're going through all this difficulty. They're on this reed within the water. And then they finally go through this molting where they think they're dying. And then they resurrect. And then they're flying up above and they've got these beautiful iridescent colors so like this beautiful. rainbow mm -hmm. right and they're looking down at the larvae <laughs> who are wondering what those things were flying up there yeah and that's just a metaphor for what we're experiencing mm -hmm. and that's what i believe the whole pandemic thing did and i don't want to discount that people suffered mm -hmm. people definitely suffered but that was a global molting mm -hmm. process each and every one of us had to go through this kind of like find yourself moment. And in the, in the shadow of all the fear that we were all experiencing. Now, I could say, okay, it was just a coincidence that Nassim was given the mask. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, wonder what the mask means. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the mask to learn to take off the mask and to gain the wisdom. That was the whole purpose in the ceremony that the, the chief of the Toltec tribe, his name is Gorilla, gave, which is, it's a mask. Now realize that it's a mask and gain the wisdom. So, you know, we could all look at life and say, oh, that was just a coincidence. That was just a coincidence. I've had so many coincidences now that I just kind of go, all right, at some point, I'm going to look at this and say, this is just not coincidental. Yeah. It's not mathematically probable. My mathematical mind steps in and says, let's do the probabilities on this mathematically. <laughs> and then you realize it's like one in trillions. No. And so much of science today is still stuck there. So that's what I was talking about. It's like what we call spirituality is just tomorrow's science. Mm -hmm. It's realizing that there are energetic signatures and subtleties and Everything in higher dimension is really just about being able to tap into your ability to perceive the subtleties. It's not smack you in the face stuff. Yeah. It's, it's rainbow bodies, right? It's, it's things that you start realizing. It's this constant synchronicities. You start tracking it down to the number of minutes between synchronicities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you start thinking, am I going nuts? What the <laughs> hell is going on? Right? Maybe, maybe I need some saffron. Right. Literally. <laughs> Maybe there's something just, turmeric, something in there, yeah. right? That does something to keep you from the psychosis. But <laughs> or maybe the way we've been living has been what's insane. 
That's exactly it. I mean, and I think that using saffron, going to sound baths, doing yoga, doing all these things is just what's going to help us tune tune back in. Because it's all just music. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. For your wisdom today. And I'm so grateful to know you and, and be in the same community as you as well. Thank you.